I'm Larry Canfer, and on behalf of the Rotarians of Champaign-Urbana, I'd like to welcome you to the seventh annual Veterans Day one-on-one. -on -one. As we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter the words, but to live by them. That's a quote from President Kennedy, and this, Veterans Day one-on-one, -on -one, is, is the Rotarians' way of trying to live by those words of appreciation. Veterans Day is, is the day Americans set aside each year to thank and honor our veterans. Veterans Day one-on-one -on -one is our opportunity to thank you, veterans, personally and directly for your service. However, please know that our gratitude is not just for today or tomorrow, but rather today we're expressing our gratitude we feel every day, all year long. Just to give you a little background on Veterans Day one-on-one, -on -one, uh, it was over seven years ago, I was talking to Rotarian Chuck Abbott, uh, and he told me that each year he takes a veteran out to lunch on Veterans Day. And that was a great way to show his appreciation, and I thought, uh, let's see if we can share this with the power of Rotary. So we started the luncheon hosted by Champaign West Rotary on Veterans Day in 2011. Seven years later, I'm glad to say that the idea sure has caught on. Um, today, we're hosted by six area Rotary Clubs. Other Rotary Clubs around the state hold their own Veterans Day 101 events. It's really fantastic to see the power of Rotary in action on Veterans Day. Um, and uh, I think it's caught on because the sentiments we're trying to express are so strong and genuine. Today at lunch, I hope you veterans will enjoy not only the program, but also sharing your stories with each other and with your hosts. And I know those of you who have invited veterans to lunch will take this great opportunity to thank, honor, and learn from our veterans. Everybody has a different story and reason that they're appreciative of our servicemen and women who protect this country. For my job as an artist, I look around and I see the magnif magnificence of every day. And I'm well aware that witnessing this beauty would not even be possible for me if I wasn't free to live my life the way I choose. And that freedom makes the world around us even more beautiful to me. In our great country, you can do just about anything. We are free to pursue education, hobbies, service, service above self, business, I started my business going door to door. Anything is possible, but you must be free to do it. I wasn't a veteran, uh, but my father was, and I'd like to tell you a little bit of his story so that you can understand why Veterans Day is so very important to me and my family. My father, Frederick Canfer, was born in Vienna, 1925. After an idyllic childhood, full of school, family, neighborhood friends, his teenage years, years turned into a nightmare. Fleeing the Nazis because of his personal beliefs, his experiences suddenly changed from discovering the gifts and opportunities in his young world to hiding under his neighbors, the Taylors, workbench in Vienna. Narrowly escaping to Belgium, he was then stuffed into cattle cars and imprisoned in southern France and finally crossed the Pyrenees in Spain in the middle of the night led by a Catholic priest. And when he finally made it to America after a long visa process and several miracles, and the miracles were actually the goodness of human nature, he was overjoyed. He wrote in his diary, which I still have, I'm in the United States now the only country with real freedom, no force, no secrets, nothing to conceal, and the possibility of activity in every field, a real democracy. Free, free, free. That's just a little bit of his diary, um, which we found um, a few years back, and the whole thing is amazing. Um, a few years after he got here, uh, he served in World War II. He became a citizen and served in World War II as an American soldier in the Army fighting in the European theater. My dad fought to get here, and then he fought to keep it free. 
and he always shared, he always shared his appreciation of our Constitution and American values with me and our family. And so today, I'm an American who appreciates every single day the freedom we have in this country and the long tradition of, of defending it that you veterans are all a part of. Another story I'd like to share with you quickly is I was lucky enough to escort my friend Carlo Anselmo in honor, on an honor flight um, to Washington, D.C. Carlo is a veteran of the Korean War, identified through the, through the shirt that, that he wore. We arrived at the Korean War Memorial, and as we were looking at the memorial, close up, a couple walked up to, to Carlo. They were Korean. With tears in their eyes, they bowed and thanked him repeatedly, over and over. I was struck with how much appreciation that there is for you veterans, and not only here in this room, but all around the world. So to you veterans and active service men and women, everyone in this room thanks you, and we will always remember what you've done for us, whether it was 70 years ago, 40 years ago, today, or what you'll be doing tomorrow. And if you would all please stand up now, I'm proud to call on the University of Illinois Naval ROTC for the posting of the colors. Thank you. Um, now, I'd like to call up Arlene Penn. The Rotary motto is service above self. Rotarians are people of action doing great projects, both locally and around the world. Rotarians are making a difference, which actually happens to be the Rotary theme, the Rotary International theme for this year. We are fortunate to have such active and energetic Rotary Clubs in the, in the Champaign-Urbana area doing such fantastic projects. And we thank these six clubs for joining forces to work together on a special project like this Veterans One-on-One. -on -one. One of the biggest projects that Rotarians around the world are working together on is the eradication of polio. We have been working on this for a number of years and are finally getting this close to completing it with only 14 new cases reported this year, those being in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Since it's been gone from the United States for a long, long time now, we tend to forget about it, but we have to remember that it's only a plane ride away. So we have to continue to fight this battle until it's been eliminated from the earth. You might have seen some of the billboards and radio spots that we've had across the district um, this month promoting our In Polio Now campaign. As I said, Rotarians are service driven. However, there is no comparison to the service that you veterans have given to our country. On behalf of Rotary District 6490, we want to express our sincerest 
deepest appreciation for everything you have done for us and our country. We welcome you to this Veterans 101 event and we say thank you for your service. Please join us now in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon, everybody. You can all have a seat. My name is Dan Baker, and I currently have the privilege of serving as the Champaign West Rotary President. And I'd like to uh, introduce our singers today. They're the Unity Banner Singers from Unity High School. Weren't they great? Give them a round of applause again. So they're going to do one more number for us, and it's a, it's a compilation of all of the military branch service songs. And so what we're going to ask you to do is when you hear your uh, medley is have you stand. So I'll let you know that the Air Force is first. So if those Air Force veterans, if you're, if, if you're able, uh, please stand now. And then once those Air Force veterans are standing, They'll get started, and then the next song it, you, you'll recognize, I'm not sure which one it is, but the Air Force folks will sit down, and then the next one will, will stand up. So, again, thank you for coming, and, and thanks to the, uh, the Unity Banner Singers.
All right, thanks everybody for that, that was great. I'd like to call up now from Urbana Rot uh, Rotary, Reverend Bob Rasmus. He is with St. Matthew Lutheran Church as well. Reverend. Thank you. Thanks. And an Army veteran. Hey. It's not a competition. <laughs> That's a surprise to some of you. Would you join me uh, before the invocation for a moment of silence? Gracious and merciful God, God of hope and healing, first we thank you for the glory of this fall day, for your spirit calling us together to remember, to encourage, to support, to support, and to honor those who have served the vanguard of the protection of our republic. We give you thanks as we remember that for those whose lives have consecrated battlefields and jungles, high seas and deserts, with the last full measure of devotion. All veterans across our nation's history who served with honor and distinction. Those who currently serve in the Army, the Air Force, the Marines, the Navy, and the Coast Guard. Bless fathers and mothers, sisters and brothers, friends and comrades in arms, spouses and families who have kept and are keeping vigil as their loved ones serve. We give thanks and remember the gifts of courage and sacrifice, perseverance and hope that have met the challenges to life and liberty and ensured freedom. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who bear the wounds of war in body, mind, and spirit, and for those into whose hands we place them for healing. We pray that you would grant your wisdom to those who command and those who follow and especially for those in whom we place this sacred trust of keeping the peace. Above all, O oh Lord, we pray in hope and trust for that for which so many have labored and sacrificed and enduring peace. And finally, O oh Lord, for this good day, for this food and this fellowship, we ask your blessing. May it strengthen us in greater love for you, for one another, and for this great nation. In your holy name we pray. Amen. My name's Jim Lukeman. I'm uh, with Rotary West, and I'm uh, privileged to be part of the Veterans 101 Planning Committee. So I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker today, Colonel Matt Shortle, United States Marine Corps. Matt attended the University of Illinois on a Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps in our OTC scholarship where he ran varsity track and field for the Fighting Illini. Matt graduated in 1994 with a Bachelor's of Science in Accountancy and a CPA designation. That was also the year Matt was commissioned an officer in the United States Marine Corps. After graduation, 2nd Lieutenant Shortle reported to Quantico, Virginia for the basic school. He completed naval flight training and was designated a naval aviator in 1997. First Lieutenant Shortle transferred to Marine Corps Fighter Attack Training Squadron 101, the Sharpshooters, at Marine Corps Air Station in Toro, California, for training in the FA-18 Hornet. Matt has been an FA-18 fighter pilot for the last 23 plus years. During that time, Matt graduated from the Naval Fighter Weapons School, AKA Top Gun, went on to fly 37 combat missions in Operation Southern Watch and Operation Iraqi Freedom, supporting the 1st Marine Division's march to Baghdad. 
He served a tour with the United States Navy Blue Angels in 2004, performing over in front of 30 million spectators at 132 air shows throughout the United States, Canada, and Europe. Matt was selected in that same year as the Marines Corps Aviator of the Year. Now a major, Major Short will continue to serve until his release from active duty in 2008 with the Marine for Life program in the Marine Corps Reserves. In 2012, Lieutenant Colonel Shortall transferred to AC2T Great Lakes, Illinois. He continues to serve in the United States Marine Corps Reserves at the Command Center Director at NORAD, Northcom in Colorado. Here we are in 2017 and Colonel Shortall has acquired over the years decorations which include the Meritorious Service Medal, Individual Air Medal with Combat V, Strike Flight Air Medal Number 3, Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal, and Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal. And yes, in his civilian world, he is a director in financial services for the Janice Henderson Investors in San Francisco, and on the board with the venture capital firm Synapse Partners. Finally, and he's very proud of this, Colonel Shorter is the aviation and military expert for the television show Pawn Stars <laughs> on the History Channel. Colonel Shorter and his wife Leslie have two young children, Cole, and their newest addition, a baby boy, Tyler Christian, as of September 12th, and she doesn't know he's gone. She thinks he's feeding right now. But, uh, but anyway, would you please give a, a warm rotary welcome to Colonel Matt Shorter. First of all, don't believe all that. I'd actually like to meet that guy. So uh, I don't know where he got all that stuff from, but um, I actually have one of my close friends from college. His dad's here. Marvin, can you wave your hand? So he knows the real me and uh, how I grew up. So he's got a few good stories. But Jim, uh, thanks for the kind introduction. It's a, a pleasure uh, to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, I haven't been back since 2011. Uh, that was the famous, uh, when Ron Zook had a 6-0, and we all flew in for the Ohio State game and got soundly beat it and went 6-6. Six and six. So what a way to finish the season. But it's good to be home. Uh, we live in Palo Alto, California uh, now, so a little warmer than here. But uh, we got just great opportunity and I appreciate the program that Larry and Jim and everybody have set up for me. Uh, I had some of the best years of my life back here in Champaign-Urbana. Now I want to clarify one thing from Jim's introduction. I uh, want to make sure my work on Pawn Stars was not misconstrued. That's Pawn, P-A-W-N. You might think something else, but no. Uh, Pawn Stars, we're actually a show on the History Channel. It's a family show, and we were the number one show on TV until uh, Duck Dynasty took us over. So and that's actually a true story. Now, I promised Larry and Jim I'd keep my comments short today. I know there's a lot of veterans in the crowd, uh, but one of the biggest benefits of being a veteran are all the free meals on Veterans Day. Uh, I've already been to Dunkin' Donuts this morning for my free donut. There's an Applebee's and a Golden Corral here in Champaign, and uh, I don't know where Bloomington is, but I gotta go there, there's a Chuck E. Cheese. So, I've got a busy day ahead of me. Now, uh, I wanna first start off, I know the choir took off, but I wanna, can the ROTC guys stand in ROTC? So let's give them a round of applause. Thanks guys, I was in NROTC, uh, that was me in 1990 to 94. I was actually in the color guard my first year. Uh, and then uh, I got, I think, booted off the color guard. But you can make it, so thank you. Now, Veterans Day actually started off as Armistice Day and it marked the end of the uh, World War I. So I think it's very fitting today that we open the doors at 11 because the um, major hostilities of World War I ended on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1980, excuse me, 1918. Later in 1954, President Eisenhower declared it Veterans Day. So that's a little bit of the history of where we're at. Um, I know we played the medley, that's always my favorite uh, part of all these events, but I do want to go around, we'll get a little more detailed into the veterans and see what services we have and from what eras. First of all, anybody know why today's date is famous? November 10th, Marine Corps. Corps birthday. Yeah, that's right. 242 years of uh, kicking butt. Now, everybody's happy Veterans Day. I think most Marines, we like that. We're actually a little more proud of the day prior. So it is our birthday. So happy birthday, Marines, uh, for 242 years.
Now, I wanna go around the room and figure out where all the veterans are and from what era. Now, hopefully we do not have any, well, we might, World War I veterans. If you do, uh, we need to talk. You're doing something right. <laughs> but if you can, when I, we talk about your era, if you can stand up. If you can't stand, just raise your hand or we'll get somebody in your party. Uh, do we have any World War II veterans in the crowd? And I know we have a couple. I know we got Maury here from the Navy. We got the gentleman there, a couple gentlemen. Wow, we have a lot. So the greatest generation, we have one over here. So World War II era. And we kind of move into the 50s, and we've got that continent of Korea. Any Korea era veterans in the crowd? There's one, one in the back. So we have two. Thank you, gentlemen, and there's three. And as we move into the 60s, early 70s, we have the Vietnam. My dad's a Vietnam vet. Any Vietnam vets? I know we have to have a bunch of them. Thank you, and for the Marine Corps this year, our Commandant has made it a promise that we're really gonna recognize the Vietnam veterans uh, because of how they were received coming back. So we've been handing out pins for the last year and really recognizing what they did in their service. Uh, how about moving into the 80s and then the 90s, we've got the Desert Storm era. Here's one, here's a couple. And then finally, we got the young guys, the OEF, OIF, so that's Operation Enduring Freedom, Afghanistan, kicked off in 01. Iraqi Freedom, kicked off in 03, really a continuation. And that's kind of my era. All the way so that kind of gives you a flavor of the veterans in the crowd. I know we recognize the services and uh, now the eras of where everybody's from. Uh, I think it's also important to recognize another group uh, and remember those veterans and another integral group that is also forgotten and those are the families of the veterans. Uh, they make big sacrifices too. Many of them have moved a lot. I served 15 years on active duty, did eight moves within that time and now the last eight years on the reserves. Uh, in addition, when they deploy, they don't see their loved ones for a long time and sometimes they go in harm's way. Uh, in Afghanistan, Syria and Iraq, we may remain engaged in combat operations and then even domestically, uh, I think Jim mentioned it. I work at NORAD Northcom right now in Colorado Springs. Our job is twofold. Number one, defend North America. So if you think North Korea scenario, you think Iran, Russia, or any type of scenario, that's our job. Uh, shoot anything out of the sky or defend the homeland. The second one is also defend support of civil authorities. So uh, all the hurricanes that have hit Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Florida, Texas. Now the state's got to ask us to come in, but we've supported all that. So. We're very busy doing that domestically and that. So let's take a moment to recognize the families of the men and women in service. All right, now the Blue Angels, it was mentioned by Jim, uh, I had the opportunity to fly with the Blue Angels for a couple years and you're probably looking at me going, hey, that's a Marine, US Navy Blue Angels, I don't get it. Uh, so the Blue Angels, uh, six jets, they got five Navy fighter pilots and one Marine. So I was a token Marine. My job was to keep them in line, make sure their uniforms, how to march, because uh, some of the Navy guys didn't know how to march. So we, I would uh, actually call the cadence, uh, just like the Marine did today. So a very similar uh, circumstance. Now, just so I got a flavor, has most people heard of the Blue Angels or potentially seen of the Blue Angels? Who's seen Chicago, Aaron C. Show, San Francisco and around? So okay, so we got a good idea of what the Blue Angels are. Uh, our mission and their mission now is twofold. Enhance Navy and Marine Corps recruiting. We're always hiring and we're looking for great folks. And then to showcase naval aviation, i.e. similar to Teddy Roosevelt's Great White Fleet. So we come from the fleet forces just like any other active duty Navy or Marine Corps fighter pilot. Uh, we're really nothing special. And then we come, we get to join that team and you're on there for about two and a half years. Uh, the Blue Angels, uh, I joined in 2004 and, and I left the team in 2006. That's a normal tour of about 27 months. Several of us on the team had been to Top Gun and uh, I think all of us had flown in Iraq or Afghanistan. 
Now, Top Gun, what is Top Gun? It's uh, also the Naval Fighter Weapons School for a Marine fighter pilot or a Navy fighter pilot, and we do have some Air Force Exchange pilots that come in. It's uh, kind of the pinnacle of uh, a Navy or Marine Corps career if you get to go there. We have a Navy squadron or a Marine squadron with 12 jets in it, and that's kind of how we maneuver and package and go around. About 18 pilots in there, and what we do is we send one of those guys or gals off to Fallon, Nevada. No, it's not in Miramar anymore. So unfortunately, we're in the middle of nowhere outside of Reno, vice San Diego. But we send one guy up there or gal, and basically you're there for nine weeks. There's a big workup prior to that, and you get all that knowledge, that training, and then come back to the squadron and train them and make sure they're ready to go to war. And that was very pertinent for me because uh, I went in 03, and March 19th, 2003 is when we went north into Iraq. So that's what Top Gun is. Uh, we do not play volleyball in our jeans or anything like that with our shirts <laughs> off. Uh, but it is actually a really good time. It's actually really hard. A lot of studying. You're flying twice a day. And as a fighter pilot, it really doesn't get any better than that. Friday night, anybody been to the Fallon Officers Club at all? So there's a pool there. I might have put the golf cart in at once. Uh, so late night, things get a little out of hand. But you go see the CO of the base the next, uh, on Monday morning, and usually you get out of it. So that's what Top Gun's all about. Now, I'm gonna need uh, a little, I'm gonna do a little demo here. For the Blue Angels, and anybody that listened to the radio interview with Jim, please don't answer. But any quest, uh, guesses on how close the Blue Angels fly? There's six aircraft. They're 56 feet by 40, weigh about 35,000 pounds. Three feet. I heard. Six, six inches. Three feet. Three feet. Six inches, 30 feet, three feet, six feet. 24 inches. 24 inches. That's close. Put some gray hair. Any other guesses out there? Oh, we're stealing my thunder. Usually people say about 30, 40 feet, and I say, no, that's what the, the girls in the Air Force fly, uh, the Thunderbirds. But, and that was just a joke. But uh, I tell you what, uh, Anna and Elena, can you guys come up for a second? We're going to do a little bit of a demo. So Larry's family, round of applause. So one of the guesses was right. So come on and just stand here and face the crowd. You can come next to the podium and then hand it to the right. And Elena, if you keep your hand out, then I'm going to move your arm if you don't mind. So Navy, Marine Corps fighter pilots, we fly about nine feet apart. So that's, we fly twos and fours, Air Force does the same thing, pretty much any other uh, NATO service in the world does that, so we can bear firepower all together. Uh, when we get to the Blue Angels, we take that nine feet, on a day, day one you're at three feet, so let me take your arm here, keep your hand down. So we're about that far apart in an aircraft going 400 miles an hour that's 56 feet by 40. <laughs> and uh, I thought they picked the wrong guy, uh, I struggled. But you learn, we start with two aircraft, then we build a three, then the four, and from November to March, we do 120 practice flights, and we slowly get that down. Now, what you see in the Chicago Air Show in August, the team's flying closer, we'll build those sets closer, and then let me see your elbow, come closer here. And we get down to about 18 inches. So you'll see the aircraft fly that far apart. You can go on YouTube or the blueangels.navy.mil and you'll see us flying about that close. So that's why I have some gray hair. So <laughs> thank you, ladies. So that gives you a little taste of what it's like in the cockpit. Um, our original team in 1946 uh, was comprised of World War II veterans. So Blue Angels have been around for 71 years. And we had naval aviators like Lieutenant Commander Butch Forrest and Lieutenant Mel Cassidy flying the F-6F Hellcat. You move that on to Korea, um, we had, due to a shortage of pilots and aircraft, we actually disbanded the Blue Angels and formed the core of VF-191, AKA Satan's Kittens, and they flew into Korea off the USS Princeton. This continued with other veterans in Vietnam. We had Admiral Moslowski, Admiral Christensen, both their sons flew with me. Um, and sadly, uh, Commander Harley Hall, who was commanded the CO of the Blue Angels two years prior, was the last POW and the last aircraft shot down on the last day of the uh, Vietnam War. In 1980, uh, he was presumed POW uh, in there, and we're still close to the family with the Blue Angels. Uh, my dad was a Vietnam veteran, flew over 300 combat missions in the F-4 Phantom, and we touched on it earlier. This year, the Marine Corps and the Commandant is really trying to recognize the Vietnam veterans for how they were received 
uh, coming back totally different than when I came back in 2003 from Iraq. Uh, Blue Angels continued to serve in combat operations in Desert Storm in early 1990s and again in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I flew in the kickoff of our Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003. We were out of Ahmad Al Jaber Air Base, about 12 miles from the border of uh, Iraq. Uh, and we came back to MCAS Miramar Marine Corps Air Station Miramar in San Diego in, in May of 2003 after toppling the fourth largest army in 19 days. Now, we're not very good at peacekeeping operations, but war, uh, we did pretty well there. And like I mentioned, a lot of fanfare, we came back, the governor Schwarzenegger and everybody came down and it, it was a little crazy for that. Um, the Blue Angels, I mentioned, we practice from November to March each year and then we go on the air show circuit. So we usually start off in the warm weather states, Florida, Texas, California, uh, from March to November, 35 air show weekends. Uh, the flying's great and believe it or not, it's probably the easiest part of the job. It's, uh, when that canopy comes down on startup, I get to focus for 42 minutes on just that flight. So family, cell phones, all this other stuff, it's, you know, uh, number one job, don't hit the ne aircraft next to me. Uh, after we land, that's, that's when we really get busy. So we go around, we meet folks from all around the country, from meeting a seven-year-old at the crowd line in Nebraska, uh, in Omaha there, or meeting the President of the United States. Uh, and hanging out in the Oval Office with him for 37 minutes. So we got to meet President Bush. Uh, usually the teams go uh, about every other year. Uh, one of the coolest things I've done, he was a veteran and a fellow aviator, so we got to trade some stories. And he's actually a bigger guy than he looks like. Uh, the one story, lesson I learned in the uh, Oval Office, don't try and go behind his desk. They don't let you look out the window. So I got quickly moved from there uh, by some folks. Uh, Tuskegee Airmen, folks heard of them. So obviously famous from the movie Red Tails, uh, Jacksonville Air Show, which is where the Blue Angels are from. Uh, we got to meet them in 2006, and that was really special and really neat to hear their stories. And uh, you know, usually folks are coming up to us, and then that uh, mode, we just sat there and received and listened to what they were talking about. So really neat to meet folks uh, like them. Other air shows, uh, former Blue Angels, there's never an ex-Blue Angel, but a former Blue Angels would all come to the show. They're always welcome. Come up, say hello, hang out with the team, trade their stories from flying the, the Hellcat, the Bearcat, uh, the Phantom, or the A A4 Skyhawk. Uh, we currently fly the F-18 Hornet, so you get to hear their stories and the challenges they had, the things they used to do, uh, and it's just really neat to hear you know, how their era treated the Blue Angels. Uh, I'd like to kind of close up my comments here uh, and talk about today's veterans. And we showed a lot of folks here that served in Iraq, you know, 90s, 2000s, even 2010 on. And those are the folks that just getting out of active uh, duty. Uh, I ended my career in 2008. And I'm a little bit of a gray era because I'm in the reserves. So I did 15 and now eight in the reserves. But I'm here to tell you, I think we're taking good care of the veterans. Uh, as a commanding officer of a squadron, every marine or sailor that was getting out, I interviewed, what's your plan, where are you going, and we tried to help them. And uh, as a future Marine Air Group commander taking over here in June, I'm going to do the same thing. So i got to manage about nine squadrons now, but we'll go through and make sure they have a solid game plan or getting out. Your average Marine or sailor serves about four years on active duty. Uh, some go on a little more, uh, some transition to the reserves, but for the most part, they serve one tour, and that's the same for other services. Now, I want you to know there's a great support network out there for them. Uh, this morning, Jim and I were over at the uh, Ron Ches Wounded Veterans Center, I believe. Uh, it was pretty neat to see what the University of Illinois is doing here at a local level. So rooms, transition services, everything. On a national level, any Marine or sailor getting out, and it's the same for other services also, I just don't know the programs as detailed, we have a mandatory week-long class for transition. So you're going to TAPS class, we've made it better than when I was there, I just attended another one, where we discuss uh, resumes, job opportunities, networking, VA benefits, education benefits, and it goes on and on, how to go to college, how to get you in there. Uh, we try to schedule this a year out from the service so this isn't kind of out the door, here you go, so you can start planning. And our leadership team is fully engaged with them as they make this transition, and we make sure they have a plan. Uh, we even have a program, and Jim mentioned it, uh, Marine for Life. That's where we have a reservist in each local town. There's a couple in Chicago because a lot of reservists. Uh, and that's where they can get in. They come into town. They can check in with that local reservist. And you don't have to have a haircut and all that other stuff. You're out of the military. And they really plug you in 
and make sure, hey, where are you living? Where's your job? How's school going? And they're there to help you. Uh, and I live in Palo Alto now. Uh, in Silicon Valley, we have a lot of tech events. So there's a big push uh, at Facebook, Google, Uber, uh, you name it. Uh, there's some guy named Mark Andreessen. You might have heard of him. Uh, he's a... Anybody heard of him? I hope so. Okay, that was a joke. But uh, Andreessen Horowitz, a venture capital firm. Uh, I'm going to a veterans uh, event there next week. So uh, he's not as involved, but his firm is fully involved in helping veterans get into the venture capital space. Uh, they brought in CEOs like Meg Whitman at HP, John Donahoe at eBay. So, I mean, we're talking the top companies here, and it's just great to see all the veterans there, and you see a couple old buddies, and then you just meet a lot of new folks. So we're really trying to dial in uh, what these veterans are doing when they transition. In regards to education, uh, the World War II veterans uh, had the Montgomery GI Bill. Uh, the new 9-11 post-GI Bill uh, discards that Montgomery GI Bill and it really updates it and makes it the largest investment in veterans education uh, since World War II. It covers the full cost of education at any uh, public university or college in the country. It provides upfront military tuition, book stipend, and it also covers your housing at an E5 level. Uh, if you go to a different school outside of, uh, a public like Stanford or Princeton or somewhere, they have the yellow ribbon program will make up that difference. So. Uh, you might have read lately uh, and last couple years the VA has been under uh, fire a little bit. We've had a little uh, fo new folks taking over a lot, but I'm here to tell you I think the VA is doing a good job. Can there be room for improvement? Okay. Some of you work in Danville? The VA? No. Oh, he does. Yeah, but I, I honestly think the VA is doing a good job. And uh, can there be room for improvement? Of course. You know, in the Blue Angels, we never flew the perfect air show. So we always had something to debrief and make better. And I, don't, I think if you don't have that mindset, uh, it's kind of like what Jeff Bezos says at Amazon, every day is day one. So you always got to innovate and get better. I've uh, read some articles here lately, uh, but I think some folks are just looking for a story. In addition, the veterans, you know, and this goes for me too, we need to take ownership and uh, make sure we do our part and our due diligence. So I do get my physical at the VA hospital in Palo Alto. Uh, it's the best physical I've ever had. It shocked me, quite honestly. Uh, but I get in, I get out, I get great service. Uh, we just had a baby, we moved. I call over, I can update things in less than five minutes. So it's really easy to work with. Uh, all the resources are there. Now, finally, uh, as you're leaving today, I'm going to assign everyone a mission. So that mission is to reach out to a veteran. Uh, it could be a family member, relative, coworker, or a neighbor. Thank them for their service. Let them know you're thinking of them. Uh, and this goes for the veterans also. So uh, I called my dad this morning on drive over, thanked him for his 30 years of service, thanked him for being my dad, and uh, thanked him and told him I loved him. So that's all I got today. Thank you, Semper Fidelis. I'm heading to Applebee's. <laughs>
uh, survived, got picked up, and it's literally, uh, I mentioned the movie Top Gun earlier, it's most of it's disregard, but that scene where they pick up Goose and Maverick in the water, it's exactly like it. I mean, spray everywhere, a helicopter, a guy jumps in the water, picks you up. But our training takes over, and uh, here I am today. Didn't do anything wrong. Make it there. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Good things the Marine Corps does uh, when people are uh, being discharged. What about the people who are having problems with PTSD and those kinds of things? Mm -hmm. What do you do with them? Yeah, so we have um, OEF, OAF coordinators. This is going to go for all across all the services. So the, the VA has kind of a grid, and you, you meet certain benefits here and there. Uh, anybody within five years, walk right in. I mean, you don't have to, and it, you can register, if, even if you're not. Even if you're an uh, older generation, Vietnam vet, uh, or anything, they'll still take you and provide services. So um, I, I think we're doing a decent job. Did we do a great job before? No. Uh, but I think the education there on what the VA is doing is a lot better now. So there are opportunities, and obviously there's a lot of other organizations out there. Uh, the Marine Corps Semper Fi Fund uh, does a great job, five-star charity. Uh, I'm on the board of the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation at Pebble Beach, so we raise money for uh, Marines and sailors who's uh, uh, worked with the Marine Corps to put their kids through college. So I, I do think there's some decent resources out there, but we can always do better. Right behind you. Yes, sir. Uh, some advice for us as uh, veterans and non-veterans, teachers, parents, and all. What can we do to get the young people of today to invest and become a part of the military? Yeah, so it's becoming a select group who's uh, serving in the military, and if you look at Congress, the numbers are dwindling in the Senate, and uh, hopefully, I think we're going to change some of that, uh, and I know uh, I mentioned uh, Marvin Morgan over there. His son's actually running for Congress, uh, first district in Michigan. Uh, I have tons of friends, actually, like five people I know running for Congress, federal Congress, which shocks me, but uh, they're all running, so I think... Uh, Education, exposure, I think there's great opportunities out there. I think we made some strides with the new post 9-11 GI Bill. Uh, it's, a, it's a great benefit to you know, do some service and then go right to college. Stay in the Marine Corps or any other service, you know, past your obligation, you don't need to, uh, unless you want to. I think you know, do, it, do your part and then move on or st stick around. So I think education, exposure, uh, I was talking to Larry earlier, about uh, just bringing some of the veterans around. Actually, we're at the Chess Center, I take that back. So they were bringing uh, some of the college kids over there just to give them exposure to the veterans and what they're doing. But you are right, it's becoming a smaller and smaller group. Any other questions? Excuse me. Yes, sir. Oh, neighbor. Is that in? still have the yep. uh, Caterpillar Club? Caterpillar Club, I, mean, I don't know. Uh, the that, companies have built the uh, made the uh, parachutes uh, uh, back in the old days anyway uh, if you use one of their shoots you, you became a member of the caterpillar plug and you got a club and you got a little pin and a card and right yeah the so I think they do that for uh, and similar to what Martin Baker did I, I have a pin at home I have a tie and I have a certificate not that I really show them yeah. uh, I have worn the tie a couple times and it's a little little ejection seats all down the tie <laughs> And a select group only knows what that is. So I'm more like, what parties are like, man, what's up? You know, we have a secret handshake. So, yes. 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 Can I ask a question about your other life? Uh, I yeah. think I saw the episode, was there a MIG jet that with Pawn Stars? And what, can you give me a little behind the scenes, Rick and that crew? I mean, it's just a very Yeah, so the question is about Pawn Stars. Uh, it's a TV show on the History Channel. Uh, we've stopped filming, although there's a game show I think Rick's got going. So once you kind of hit 300 episodes, the show starts to die off. Uh, so I flew, basically I go on there and uh, you know slap high fives, hey, my good buddy. And they always say, hey, my good buddy, man, it's a Navy Blue Angel pilot. I'm like, Marine, but they, they always miss that. Uh, so, and who, who's seen the show? Rick, Chumley, everybody? Okay, so we've seen some folks. Um, so I flew an L-39, which is a Czechoslovakian jet. It's a Russian trainer, uh, Category 2 fighter. Uh, I flew that jet for them, and it was actually, we keep it real. I mean, I don't get to meet the buyer before I get there, because I, I don't want to look like a clown on national TV. Um, so I, I do a lot of homework before I get there. I know what's coming on. I fly to Vegas, usually shoot two episodes, and, um, you know, I, and then I try to make up a price. 
So uh, <laughs> I, I, they didn't have a sale, at least the one I saw. No, I flown a couple jets for him. So his son Rick uh, actually flies. Uh, no, Corey. Sorry, Rick's the dad. Uh, Corey actually flies, and I'm exactly. like. They have a lot of money right now. They make a lot of money on that show. Um, and the, the pawn shop makes about a million bucks a month just on trinkets they sell in there. Uh, there's a line three blocks long to get in. What about the old man? Old man, Navy veteran uh, on the show. I think he's a retired chief. And uh, he's slowing down. Yeah, yeah we sometimes we'll, we'll be filming and uh, Rick will kind of tap him underneath. And he's like, <laughs> that brings up a good point, man. And I'm like, you know, and it's kind of like uh, Roger Dangerfield, and everybody's like, say it, say it, you know. So we have to keep him awake when we shoot. But he, he's slowing down. But fun show, great, great bunch of guys. So, and yes, Chumley, uh, we don't need to feed him lines. Some of those comments, he just starts throwing them out there. So he just got arrested a little bit ago. But hang it in there. All right, we've got time for maybe one or two more. Yes, sir. Any experience in the area? Any experience in a Harrier? Are you a Marine Corps Marine? I'm a Marine. Marine? Okay. So, uh, the Harrier. If you saw the movie uh, True Lies uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger, it's the jet that goes straight up and then goes. So, uh, as you go through flight school for the Marine Corps, we're the only ones that fly it for the U.S. Um, you kind of go Hornets or Harriers once you go jets. And uh, Harriers are out of Cherry Point, North Carolina, or Yuma, Arizona. Two places I really didn't want to live. Uh, there's this place called San Diego, California, where you fly F-18s out of. Um, so very little. I, I've flown packages in Iraq with them and went through WTI with them, which is uh, it's a Marine Corps Top Gun course. But um, that's getting phased out, and we're bringing in the F-35 now, which is the new Joint Strike Fighter. If you read the Wall Street Journal, it's in there all the time. And we have the new uh, A stole ball version, so advanced short takeoff vertical landing. So basically. We can land on a runway in Iraq, reload weapons bombs, take off straight up, and take off. Or in a short runway. So it gives us a lot of flexibility to land on ships. Uh, but I haven't flown the Harrier, but uh, flown with them a lot. So uh, good aircraft, but the F-18s and Harriers are all going away. We're all going to the Joint Strike Fighter. How about the Osprey? Oh, the Osprey. So uh, the Osprey is a helicopter that turns into a plane. So uh, your question was uh, the Osprey, and it's the MV-22 for the Marine Corps. Air Force is flying it, and think of a helicopter that goes up, it can load about 23 combat-loaded Marines in it, and then actually the propellers go forward and the plane can go forward. And what that does, it gives us a lot more range, a lot more speed. Uh, it was perfect for Afghanistan, so if we wanted to get in. But I, I have not, I've been in one, I haven't flown it. So I'll have a couple, when I take over in June, I'll have a couple instructors that are flying it. But uh, I try to stay in the jets and away from the helicopters. So, got one in the back. Yes, sir. Can you comment on the readiness of our forces now based on the last nine years of governmental budget increases? Yes, so the, the question was can I comment on the readiness of our forces? So, uh, I can, I'll give you a general and then I can go specific on the Marine Corps. So, we're, full honesty, we're beat up. I mean, we're our aircraft. Uh, if you look at F 18 readiness, 100% would be perfect. Normally we're in the 60s and 70s. I think last time I looked we're at 38%. So uh, we're really, um, we're struggling here, especially in aviation. Uh, and we're trying to get everything retrofitted. We're getting everything, well we were getting everything out of the desert, we've gone back. Uh, and we're kind of doing a pivot to Asia. Uh, but we definitely are a little beat up. I think the force is getting recharged, uh, personnel wise, but equipment wise, uh, we need to do a lot of refurbishing, especially in aviation. And Air Force has seen the same thing with their planes. Uh, we've just worn out a lot of equipment over the last 10, since 2001, quite honestly. So, yeah, great question. Marvin. Don't, don't worry, I'm not going to Okay, don't, don't die me out here. He's known me since I was 17, so. I'm going to tell you a good story. I'm going to move along. I'd have to be with my son involved also. But uh, in the uh, Blue Angels, did you use g -Sus? In the Blue Angels, the question is, in the Blue Angels, did we use G-Suit? Now, a G-Suit is basically something that goes uh, along your calves, your hamstrings, and right through your abdomen here, and it basically inflates. Anytime 
we're banking and maneuvering in a jet and think of a, a positive G where you're at the bottom of the roller coaster and getting slammed in your seat or in the top, that's a positive G. On the top where you're kind of floating, that's a negative G. So you can take, uh, in the Blue Angels we do minus three to plus eight. So that, that's a lot. Uh, normal civilian about minus 0.5 uh, to about three and you pass out. Unless uh, you're Dale Earnhardt or you know uh, Jimmy Buffett, or we flew a couple people in the Blue Angels like that. John Travolta, they're pilots, or obviously Dale Earnhardt flies race or drives race cars. So most people we flew passed out or got sick or both. <laughs> but we don't fly with G suits in the Blue Angels, and it's not because we're trying to be a menly man or anything. But we're just uh, when we fly, we put our arm right here and kind of build a fulcrum. Uh, and obviously the G suit was inflating up and down. Our arm would move and that would be bad when you're 18 inches away. So we don't fly with a G-suit. If you saw the movie The Right Stuff where you get swung around in that centrifuge, we do a lot of that training. Everybody has to pass that. It's, it's a painful day and your capillaries are all busted in your eyes and uh, you know, you're tired when you go home. So we don't fly with G-suits, but we're highly trained. Uh, we got a lot of experience. You have to have 1,350 tactical jet hours, aircraft carrier qualified. So that kind of whittles the crowd down pretty quickly. Yeah. So I see Larry here with the hook. I saw one more over here and I'll end it. Um, when you were at the Blue Angels, did you ever do the Quad City Air Show? I did, yes. And I even played that golf course over there. Uh, where they hold the John Deere? Yeah. Yes, so they, they were great. And I forgot the gentleman who does that air show. He recruits us heavily. Hooper. Hooper, yes, Hooper. So he's, every uh, end of the year he sends us, uh, even if we're not going to the air show, he sends us a Blue Angel model of our jet uh, with the Quad Cities Air Show. So we love that show. Um, it's, it's really fun, and we get to play golf there. I mean, you know, it's the Midwest. Everybody's so nice. And uh, they, do a, yeah, they do a great job in the air show. And I flew in the, is it Bloomington, I think? Yeah. Right over here. And then uh, Alumni Association came over, my college track coach, and uh, a couple professors came over. So it's pretty neat to come back to the Midwest. So great show. Oh, and then just let me know real quick what the Blue Angel means overall. I made that example in Europe this morning. Um, okay, uh, so we got to go uh, overseas. I talked about we did 35 air shows. Now, if our job's to enhance Navy and Marine Corps recruiting, we're pretty much going to stay in the U.S. However, uh, we did go overseas. The team went overseas to Russia in 92, and then in 2006, my second year, we went to Europe, went to Lee Warden. They loved their air shows over there, and it's kind of like the World Championships. Uh, a normal air show that has about 45, 50,000 people, they had 750,000 show up. Uh, so it was a little crazy. Uh, the French were there, uh, the Swiss, the British Red Arrows with their Hawks. You know, the French are out there smoking right by their jets right before they go. <laughs> They wouldn't talk to us. Uh, you know, the Swiss are there. The, you know, the Brits, we all get along, and most of us flew in Iraq together. So it was a little bit like the World Championships. We were feeling some pressure, and we had been there since 92 that we went last, and we had the premier aircraft. We're flying the F-18 Hornet. Uh, but, you know, we wanted to put on a good show, and we're actually the only team that afterwards goes and meets the crowd. And uh, I had two uh, German Shepherds on both sides of me with guys with rifles, which we're not used to. Uh, but in Europe, they do things a little different. So we got to go over there and kind of showcase, uh, kind of like I mentioned Teddy Roosevelt's great white fleet. So we kind of showed what the U.S. can do. So great question. Well, thank you. Thank you, Colonel, Colonel Shortle. Um, for your words, and you know, I, I have to tell you, it never gets this cold here. So this is just, um, we appreciate you coming. I know your schedule's busy. We've been trying to do this for a couple of years. Um, finally, I, I just want to say a sincere thank you to all of those of you who participated uh, in today's program, honoring and thanking our veterans. Um, beside, behind the scenes, um, the C Rotary, Rotary Area wide planning committee, in particular Ata Durakan, uh, who skillfully coordinated this event, and our committee members. Uh, if you could please stand up. Uh, Dan Baker. Chris Moore. Jim Lukeman. AJ Toma. Jason Sikowski. John Rector. Don Van Busker, uh, Alejandro Cornell, thank you.
they all worked tirelessly to have this go off without a hitch. Um, I want to also help uh, thank, thank uh, our sponsors who helped us out, Habib Habib, H2, and BPC, Carl, First Federal Savings, Hickory Point Bank, and a number of others listed in the program. Um, I also want to mention we have photos of you when you came in. They're on the tables. You can take them when you go when you leave. Uh, and we have these coins on the table that you can take. Um, we all the photographs and video from today will be on our website, veteransday1on1.com. And uh, most of all, our Rotary International motto is service above self. You veterans truly embody service above self. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for your service and thank you for your dedication to this country. And now I'd like to call for the retiring of the colors. If you'd all stand, thank you. Missed. 